All right, let's begin by talking about just how miserable French players are. They didn't have the skills to play an open fighting position, and since they can't really remember anything, they had to choose a closed structure. And that's the advantage of a closed structure. You start playing your own game a little sooner. And with the French, they got to specialize in a specific kind of trench warfare that has its own rules. Hold the line, Johnny! And then you're throwing your grenades over the barricades. And they learned how to do it. They got good at it. Now, how do I know all this? Well, I've been playing the French since the last millennium. And today, I'm wearing my black shirt because I'm here to betray my tribe. Just a quick reminder, please hit subscribe and check us out on Twitch and Discord as well. All right, in all the opening videos I do, I try to keep things as simple as possible. And that's because, from my own experience as a player, the most effective opening prep I do is when I simply understand the gist of what's going on in the system. That gives me an advantage on the clock and gives me a sense of where the pieces belong. And this is certainly an example of that. Now, you know, as a French player, what I normally face are knight c3 or knight d2. And of course, I could advocate for some system uh, like that here on this channel. But the problem with both of those moves is if I was going to cover them, it would take a long time because black can do several different things against them. The move I'm going to advocate for is e5. It's a very simple setup that I'm going to show you guys today. c5 is pretty much their only move. We go c3, knight c6, knight f3. And this looks like a traditional advanced French, but we are going to play it a little bit differently. Now, before we get into some of the side variations, let me just dive right into um, the main line and idea. After queen b6, we're going to just put the bishop where it belongs, on d3. Now, this is a good point to talk about some of the, the basic ideas in the French. First, let's just say that a joy that black has in these positions it is he's actually up in time. He's got two pieces out, we do too, but it's his move, right? Uh, and the other thing about black is when you think about it, he really controls two center squares, and we only really control uh, you know, arguably just one here with d4 under contention. And d4 really is going to be the source of black's counterplay. And he's going to try to say, before you mate me on the king side, and that is where white wants to play because his pawns are pointing that way, that is where he has space. Black is going to say, before you mate me on the king side or squeeze me out of existence because I have less space, I am going to make you have grief with your d4 point, right? And I'm going to play, black is going to play on the queen side, because that is where the black pawns are pointing. So, um, those things are essential to understand in any French structure. And by the way, there's many different ways you can get to a French structure. You can get to a French structure with reverse colors. All of what I said will apply. Now, this bishop d3 move is a real funny business because, of course, the bishop wants to go there. And the only controversy is that the queen is no longer protecting this point. All right. Now, um, let me begin by showing you a variation that, that makes me squirmy. And uh, it's not the variation I want to recommend, but if you understand it, it'll help us uh, move on from where we are here. So it takes, takes, now we can't take immediately because of bishop b5 and you lose the queen. So what he's going to have to do is play bishop d7, so there's no more check on b5, snip, queen d4, knight c3. And this is in fact a very dangerous thing for black. And uh, we're going to play a more advanced version of this, but this is an old-time gambit. And what I want to stress about this is something that's going to pertain very much to our uh, gambit as well. 
that black doesn't want the open violence of this kind of position. It's just not what he is ready for. He wants the trench warfare, and this is going to blow everything up, and he's going to lose his time advantage. Okay, so let's go back, and what our trick is going to be is that if they take, we are just going to castle. And it's a really delicious uh, move because it turns out that it's not so easy for black to play and now it's getting really squirmy because as black i don't really want to take that pawn but if i make any other move i have to also be prepared for c takes d4 now bear in mind if white gets to play c takes d4 and just wins the pawn back then we've got this ideal attacking structure and i don't even need to sit here lecturing uh, big time about how to play that structure because it really does kind of play itself. You want to mate the guy on the king side. All right, so let's first though look at what would happen if he takes here. All right, we'll take. Now notice that c3 point was blocking our knight and now we got it out. And black can do a bunch of different things. Let's just choose a couple with knight ge7 is one. Let me say something obvious. When we played e5, it was it feels like a loss of time because it's a pawn move, but it really does commit the black knight to taking two moves to develop. Right? So let's try knight e7. We'll try other things in a little bit. Bishop e3. And it's it's very unpleasant. Um, the queen really has to go back. If uh, queen takes b2, I think it's just lost after knight b5. Yeah, it is, in fact, just lost after knight b5. So you're going to have to go back. And then, honestly, we don't need to do too much here. We could play knight b5, uh, or we could just play a very simple rook c1. And here's one of the things I want to stress, is that in these positions, if you win so much time, you do not need to fret about being down a pawn. You simply have a great attacking position. And if you say to yourself, Jesse, look, I don't like being down the pawn. Well, let me tell you, Black doesn't like this position either. He is not happy. And that's one of the main things I want to preach about this kind of opening against the French. Black doesn't want it. And so we're playing against the nature of the French player when we do this. Let's look at a couple other moves. Let's say uh, Bishop d7. Bishop e3. Um, again, I think the guy needs to go back to queen d8. But let's just, for kicks, say queen takes b2, knight b5, rook c8. And there's more than one move here. But the simple rook e1 is really nice. We're threatening to trap the queen with a3 and rook e2. So he's got to do... It's, it's really a bummer. If a6, for example, we can do this and the queen's gone. Um, if queen b4 to run away... We're coming at him with everything we've got. And uh, honestly, this to me looks like it's lost. Queen h5, queen f3 is coming very soon. And all of our pieces are involved in the attack. You know, so again, when we get to this position with bishop d7, bishop e3, well, if he goes back, what I want you to do is just have faith in the mini, mini tempi that you have ahead of black. Um, let's just count them out. I've got one, two, three, four, five, and he's got two. That's it, right? And we are coming fast and furious with both rook c1 and the knight g5s of the world and the very simple just building moves because even if black gets to castle someday, he is not going to be safe over there. And we're going to see some more variations like that. Okay. So let's say we castle, and Black thinks about it for a little while, and says bishop d7. Well, I think that's a fine move. I think that's what Black should play. So rook e1. Now, if he takes, it's going to be a very similar situation. Uh, let's say a6, bishop e3. Um, and here's a nice trick, actually, that I should have mentioned last time. The, the, the same trick will apply. If d4... Let's say this is one of the few tricks you really do need to remember. We have knight takes d4, exclam. Knight takes queen g4. 
And there's no defending the knight because on bishop c5, that's the end of the rook. So huge advantage for white. Well, let's call it a, a nice advantage for white in any case if he does that. And then what happens? Well, he goes back and again, we say, thank you very much. Well, and with a6, you know, if he doesn't, if he takes away a6, or excuse me, b5 from our knight, we have these things to look forward to as well. Another promising position with a lot of initiative. Okay, so, um, 97. Now, here is my secret sauce here that I'm willing to divulge. It seems anti-intuitive at first because it feels like, oh, our uh, knight wanted to go to c3. But in fact, what's going to happen now is we are going to demand that the guy takes on c3. Our rook is going to come to b1, and we have this beautiful attacking structure ahead of us. Let's say he takes now. We were going to make him take with anyway with knight b3. Um, I want you to note that that pawn on c3 might look weak, but it is in fact dominating the knight on c6 and is going to be helpful for us in using the d4 point ourselves. Um, uh, bear in mind, when we give him the pawn on d4, it's no longer a source of worry for us anymore as white. Here's a sample variation. Bishop e7, rook b1, castles, and almost any time he castles, it's time to play Harry the h-pawn. And this is very dangerous. Uh, h5 is coming, knight g5 is coming. And <clears throat> a simple thing about rook e1 I want to mention, not only are you protecting the pawn, not only maybe someday are you going to lift on rook e3, but you're going to make things like f6 a little bit more awkward. And the thing to understand about f6 is f6 is really the break that black is going to need to defend himself when all of the white pieces come at him because he has less force on the king side. That's what it means to have to be the weaker side is when you just have less force over there. So just as an example, if you try to take the thing, we get this position, and as far as I can tell, this is just lost. We have uh, bishop a3 coming, knight d4 coming, rook e3 coming. The whole, the whole thing is happening to black in this position. Well, let me show you what the computer liked. I thought it was in, kind of instructive. He wanted to play queen, excuse me, queen c7. Well, okay, I bring the knight in. Am I threatening knight b5? Well, it's pretty annoying. And again, if you castle, h, h4 is coming. So a6, by the way, here's a nice variation, snip. Thank you very much. Again, this is precisely the kind of thing that the French player does not want. Bishop d6, bishop b5. And uh, it's a pretty nasty little position for black. Um, he's having trouble moving. For example, if you go something like that, I'm going to take, and you can't take, well, it's an absolute nightmare. If you take this way, I'm going to do this, and probably knight f5 in addition to rook b7 hanging. Oh, man, disaster. And if you take with the king, then knight b5 is happening. So complete disaster. So let's say a6, and now here's a nice one. Bishop takes, king takes, queen e2. Uh, there's other moves, honestly, but this is just mobilizing everything, so it appeals to my aesthetic sensibilities. Knight c4, bam! And it's a full-on smackdown. It's all over. And this is the kind of thing that keeps a French player like myself up at night. It just scares, scares me to death. I want no part of it. Okay, so, like I said, it's a very simple system. Only a couple tactics to remember and I would say this is like the critical position. You know, black can do a couple different things, but this is basically what it looks like. And notice, we've got all our pieces in a beautiful situation. And if you get your rook to b1, what you can tell yourself, and it's very true, is that the bishop is developed where it stands. So black, white is already near full mobilization, and black's king is not safe either in the middle, the queen side, or the king side. And I feel like that's the dream of the e4 player in general. To attack. 
All right, let me cover a couple quick sidelines. Um, a move order mistake that black will make often, and I've made it myself as, as black, uh, is that you say to yourself, well, white didn't take this pawn earlier, so let's not free the knight and let's play bishop d7. It's a mistake because now when we take, we can just simply develop and hold the f2 pawn before our bishop was on f1. And it feels at first ridiculous because it feels like we just allowed that bishop to c5, but in fact, like this points to a lot of the confusion in the black position. For example, there's no knight e7 because of b4. So already, suddenly, black is in a hard uh, situation and we still have we're gonna, what we're going to call our attacking formation with knight f3 and bishop d3. As an example, let's say a5. We continue to develop threatening knight b3. If a4, well then we're going to play b4. And we haven't even given up a pawn and we have this beautiful attacking position. Uh, as a French player, I don't really want to give up my bishop, but if I move it, there's going to be another tempo either here or here. So a very difficult situation. And if you play this move, bishop d3, you will encounter bishop d7 often. It's just a co very common mistake. Like I said, because black thinks that since you didn't take it last time, he's free to play bishop d7 here. Okay. Now, notice that if you play, that if they play something like bishop d7, that's also a very common move. Uh, just play bishop d3, and the reason people play bishop b7 is like, they're like, well, if bishop d3, then queen b6, but here we're just back in our normal business, right, where we're just going to castle, and we're going to let him take on d4. All right, so um, actually, in fact, in fact, it's already a little, heck, I, I take it all back. It, you see, I made the mistake. I'm a French player, and I did it myself. After bishop d3, there's no queen b6. I'm going to take here. This is a very, that's how common it is. So he's going to have to transpose into this line again, uh, but, but a very nice position for white. So um, another line that I've played as black is either knight e7 or knight h6. And this is a playable line, but we're going to do very similar things. We're going to play bishop d3, and now he's going to have to really give our knight an out. Well, I shouldn't say have to. He could play knight f5, and we could again get this nice structure. And my word of wisdom is you're in no hurry to take the knight on f5. It's just a constant source of pain for black. And if you take it, then his bishop can become a large pawn on e6 and maybe hold the day. But there's no hurry to take the thing. Just develop your guys, and you have a nice position. Um, so knight g7, bishop d3, takes, takes, knight f5, and there's many moves here. Uh, take on f5 is the, a move that many GMs have played, but personally I think the move that annoys the black player the most is bishop e3. And so what we're going to say is like, well, you can take my bishop on e3, but now all your counterplay against e4 is gone, and my rook is going to land on f1, and I'm going to have the dream of the f-file with, a, again, a very nice attacking position. So there it is. My very simple, easy system against the French, very easy to learn, and hopefully something you can enjoy and build upon as your chess progresses in a way where you study more important things than just openings. Bye-bye.